One of the things that um, I find interesting is that every year at this time, uh, California and Oregon and Washington and parts of Nevada go through a spate of forest fires, and they come up every year at this time, and we hear about the heroic firefighters and uh, how much damage has been done and all of these things, not nearly, of course, the coverage for Hurricane Katrina because it's not quite the same. It's not on the same scale. But we hear all of this year after year after year, and I have never, ever heard it mentioned that all of this damage takes place on government property, that these are government forests that are burning. If it were a Boise Cascade forest, for instance, you'd hear about it. You'd, uh, the the uh, news would mention that the Boise Cascade forest was on fire and that Boise Cascade was marshalling its resources to fight the fire. Now, why do you suppose that is? Well, I can only surmise that it is because Boise Cascade has figured out how to avoid forest fires, just as they have figured out how to avoid the environmental damage that's taking place on government property. Uh, all through the government forest, you see these ceilings that are uh, are being damaged and that are dying from uh, various kinds of uh, tree diseases. But right next door to some of these government forests are uh, forests owned by Boise Cascade and other private companies, and you never hear about damage to these properties because these companies have figured out how to take care of their property. And more than anything else, they have an incentive to take care of their property. They have to worry about the future value of that property. And if the future value goes down because of the various kinds of forest diseases, then the dividends dry up immediately. And when the dividends dry up, or even if the thought is in the air that the dividends will dry up five years from now, the price of the stock goes down. And the stock options and warrants and anything else that's held by the executives of the country of the company become worth much less than they were before. So the managers of the company have an incentive to make absolutely sure that these forests are kept in prime condition. And when they do, they make sure that there is no environmental degradation. But meanwhile, next door or down the uh, highway someplace is a government forest which is uh, undergoing severe degradation, and we hear about that. And it's just a matter of simple logic that people who do not own the property that they are tending cannot possibly take as great an interest in its future value as those who do own the property or who are employed directly by those who own the property. Well, who owns the government property? Oh, we all own the government property. It's yours and mine and everybody in the United States. But that's meaningless, absolutely meaningless. If I am a part owner in that government property, I want to sell my share immediately. Get a broker on the phone and get me the best price possible. I don't care what that is. I just want out. But I can't do that. Therefore, I have no stake in the future value of that property, whether it's a forest or a mine, uh, a property that has mines on it, or a property that is grazed. It's the same thing. And what happens is that the uh, as the value goes down, there is nobody who really cares, not the people who are leasing the property, not the people who are, when I say leasing it, the people who are actually uh, using the property, leasing it from the government, and using the property to mine or to graze or to clear-cut the forest, whatever it may be. They have no uh, concern about the future value. Their concern is to get as much out of the property in the short term as they possibly can. And so there is a tendency to overgraze. There is a tendency to clear-cut. There is a tendency to strip mine, to do whatever will get the greatest value out in the short term. Now, the people who are actually managing the property and leasing it to these companies also don't have a stake in it. They don't own any options or warrants uh, or anything that would give them a stake in the future value. Now, what do you suppose would happen if the government sold that property to the people who are actually using it? Suddenly, those companies that are using it would have a real incentive to take the long term into consideration as they do when they do own their own properties around the country. There are mines that are owned by the people who are using it. There is grazing land that's owned by the people who are using it. And there are forests that are owned by the people that are using it. And the popular impression is that these companies are just raping the land, uh, doing whatever they need to do to get profits out immediately. But that isn't true. They only do that when they don't own the property, not when they do. And that's why we need to get this property out of the hands of the government and into the hands of people who will care for it. And if we put this property up for sale over the next, say, six years, auction it off, um, it might produce a heck of a lot of money to take care of some of the debts of the government. There are assets there if the government would only get rid of them and make those assets much more useful. Um, 
you know, oh, always in the news, ever and forever is the Iraq War. And I can't help but believe that it will be with us for several years to come, at least, at the very least until 2008, when possibly somebody will be elected, a Republican or Democrat, who sees the folly in continuing this thing and will bring it to some kind of a conclusion, possibly declaring victory and, and uh, withdrawing American troops. But I can see that George Bush is not going to do that because George Bush is living in a fantasy world. He has made so many statements that make no sense whatsoever, such as, we told Saddam Hussein to disarm, and he wouldn't disarm, so we went in and made him disarm. Disarm what? Turned out he didn't have anything to disarm. He, uh, he didn't have any biological, chemical, or nuclear weapons, so what was it that he was supposed to disarm? And yet, George Bush acts as though that's what happened. And, of course, he talks as though Iraq is now a free and peaceful country that it wasn't when Saddam Hussein was in power. Well, as a matter of fact, life was better under Saddam Hussein, although I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form that it was a place where you would want to live or even Iraqis would want to live. But today there's very little uh, electricity. It's, generally speaking, uh, transferred around the country. You get electricity on these days and none the next days and so on and so forth. Gasoline is rationed in the country that was the second largest oil producer in the world, and here gasoline is rationed today. And there are, uh, are long, long lines at the gas pumps there. And uh, you can just go on and on. Uh, clean water is in scarce supply. And, of course, uh, Bush and other people in the administration try to make a big thing out of the, out of the good work that's being done by the military and uh, the American military. They're rebuilding schools and hospitals and so on. Well, why do they have to rebuild these schools and hospitals? Because they were destroyed by the American military, because they were, were bombed or missiles or, or uh, just simply... Uh, straight and the whole cities have been devastated like Fallujah and those cities have to be rebuilt and I can't believe that the residents of those cities are grateful to America for rebuilding the cities that America destroyed so I don't see anything that George Bush has said that makes any sense whatsoever but yet he likes to believe or likes to make us think he believes or he would like us to believe that we have won a victory in Iraq no, there's more work to be done, that's for sure. Peace comes at a price and so on. But basically, in his view of the world, Iraq has turned into a democracy, a peaceful democracy that will not threaten its neighbors anymore. Just as, um, now that I think of it, Saddam Hussein wasn't threatening his neighbors. He was disarmed after the Gulf War, and he was a toothless tiger from then on for the 12 years between the two wars. And the United States and British airplanes were bombing Iraq continually, and uh, imposing sanctions, and as a result, uh, Hussein was in no position to threaten anybody. He had no arms to speak of. Uh, he was not in a position to threaten anybody. And Bush has the gall to imply that he was actually threatening the United States. That's what he said before the war, and that's what he says in retrospect. Uh, now, I mention all this not to rehash the obvious, but to point out that we have a president that is living in a fantasy world. There's no other way to describe it. He is describing things that do not exist. I believe that that is the definition of hallucinations, when people see things that aren't there. So the question really is, does he see these things? Does he believe these things? Or is he merely whistling in the dark and hoping that we will believe them? Well, it's obvious that fewer and fewer people are believing him. Uh, the latest uh, polls indicate that only about 30% of the people in America think that it was a good idea to go to war in Iraq. And Bush's approval rating keeps going lower and lower and lower, and it's, of course, well below 50% now. So... Who knows what would happen if Bush were up for re-election next year instead of uh, not being up for re-election at all in any year. And who knows if um, somebody had to run on his coattails. Obviously, Dick Cheney is not going to run for president. But if somebody had to run on the Bush record, I can't imagine that he would win no matter who he was running against, whether it was Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, Al Gore, uh, anybody in the Democratic Party. So what we need to be on guard against is the feeling that we would have been better off with John Kerry or Al Gore because that is not a given. For all we know, they would have done the same things. For all we know, once the war had started, John Kerry would not have brought it to a close but would have tucked it out, sent more troops over there. He even said in the debates with George Bush last year that the sanctions were working and that we didn't need to go to war because the sanctions were working. Well, the sanctions caused the death of hundreds of thousands of innocent Iraqis. So we know right off the bat that John Kerry has no more regard for human life than George Bush does. In fact, more people died in the sanctions than undoubtedly have died in the war so far. So
So uh, what we have here are politicians who have no regard for human life. That's the only way to put it. And if people will peddle falsehoods to bring us into a war, that's not a mistake. Uh, that's not a calculation. That's not a strategy. That's cold-blooded murder. And if Bill Clinton could be impeached on the basis of a stain on address, what should George Bush be impeached for? We're having a little trouble getting a hold of Mary on the phone, but we will keep trying. And meanwhile, let's take a call from Frank in Brooklyn. Good evening, Frank. Good evening, Harry. I enjoy your uh, commentary, and I uh, agree with uh, your discourse. Uh, what I wanted to say was basically that uh, the last presidential election, what I found most uh, uh, amusing and sadly amazing was the fact that uh, John Kerry had no differences with regard to economic policy, social policy, or the Iraq war policy uh, than President Bush. So in a sense, in a nation of uh, 312 million people, to have two uh, candidates espousing the same policy just seems to be a contradiction uh, in a democratic republic. Quite a coincidence, huh? It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and in fact, Kerry would have had to go a long, long way to appear to be an outspender of Bush, to appear to, to want more government than George Bush did, because George Bush was bragging about some of the things he did, and uh, like the uh, prescription drug program that he was proposing and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, um, uh, I, you know, we've always felt that there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between them, but I don't know that we've ever had an election in which that was so glaringly obvious as it was last year. It reminds me of uh, uh, Jersey Kaczynski's novel, Being There, with Chance the Gardener. But oh. what's interesting is the fact that our uh, current president can't put the metaphors within a specific context. At least Chance, or Chauncey Gardner, was able to do that. And I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for calling, Frank. Good evening. So, I guess getting back to uh, the Iraq War and uh, George Bush's, uh, stand on it and his policies on it. It, it has been just the, the most disastrous situation from the beginning to the end. It wasn't just that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, there were no mobile laboratories. There were no aluminum tubes that could be used for uh, nuclear reactors. There were, were there was no attempt to get enriched uranium from Africa, as they claimed, as Bush claimed that Hussein was trying to do. There were no Al Qaeda trading camps around Baghdad, as was claimed. All of the claims that were made against Hussein turned out to be false. And we have to take, then, any other claims that have not been proven or refuted yet with a grain of salt. We have to wonder if all these terrible things that Hussein is alleged to have done to his own people actually took place un until we get some kind of independent verification of it. And by independent, I mean coming from someplace other than the U.S. government. As I said before, we have to realize that 90% of what we know about foreign affairs emanates from our government, that that's where the information comes from. And uh, we get now with the Internet, we get some information independently. We can read foreign newspapers. We can uh, uh, get uh, information about the Middle East from Al Jazeera. Uh, we can get information about Europe from uh, uh, various sources like the Financial Times and so on, and all this information comes to us instantly now rather than having to go through the mails and take weeks before we really know what's going on. So uh, we're much better off than we were before, but we still uh, have to rely on our government for a great deal of information. And uh, when I say for a great deal of information, I should say for a great what we're relying on is, oh, how should I put it, statements that are made by our government. Maybe allegations is too strong a word. But all of these things are done with a partisan tinge to them. And all of these things that come out of our government are colored by the party that's in office and what that party wants us to believe. Uh, if our party wants us to believe that Iran is cheating on its uh, agreements with regard to nuclear development, then um, that's what we're going to hear, that uh, Iran has done this and that it is known to have done this and that. And Hussein uh, violated X number of UN resolutions and so on. And not only do we have to wonder whether the numbers are accurate, whether the statements are accurate, but we also have to wonder whether they've been taken out of context. It would help when it's mentioned that uh, Iran, Iraq, for instance, has uh, violated 17 U.N. resolutions to know that the United States has violated double that number of U.N. resolutions. In fact, the country that has violated more U.N. resolutions than anybody else is the United States, and in second place is Israel, and Iraq is somewhere down the line somewhere down the list, 7th, 10th, I don't know where. But the point is that these things are out of context. We get no perspective on them. And the only antidote for this that I can see is to read the foreign press on the Internet. And there you get the uh, perspective of people like Robert Fisk and uh, uh, Eric Margolis and some others who write for the U.K. Independent and The Guardian and some of these other publications and uh, uh, are historians in, in essence in that they know a great deal about history. 
and they they put a uh, they put a context on everything that's going on today. Uh, Eric Margolis, for instance, has written extensively about how the British came into Iraq and said, "We come not as occupiers or conquerors; we come as liberators." Well, for 20 years, the liberators had to fight off the insurgents, just like our military is doing today. And it is my pleasure now to introduce Mary Ruart, who is a research scientist in the pharmaceutical industry and the author of a path-breaking libertarian book called Healing Our World, which uh, came out at least more than a decade ago and now is coming out in a new edition. And, uh, Mary, we're so glad to have you with us tonight. Well, I'm glad to be with you, Harry. And um, uh, just give us a, a, a brief breakdown of uh, the theme of Healing Our World. Well, Healing Our World talks about liberty in a very different way than most libertarian books that talk about rights and things of that nature. In fact, I don't use the word right in the book at all. What I do is just take the everyday relations that we have with each other as neighbors and show how we apply those same principles, which of course are the libertarian principles, that we would have unprecedented prosperity and harmony. And I go through step by step how it works in the real world and make the pragmatic case for liberty. In fact, there's over a thousand references in Healing Our World. Although, to keep it light, I use cartoons and other devices because it's easy to get bogged down in research. Yeah, a thousand references. You mean uh, examples of things? That's right. Hundreds of, really hundreds of real-life examples of how liberty works in the real world. Because I think one of the reasons we lost our liberties was that early in the uh, 20th century, people said, well, you know, the people who wanted to get rid of liberty uh, said, hey, you know, liberty is a fine concept, but it doesn't work in the real world. It doesn't help the poor. It doesn't save the environment. It doesn't stop criminals. And so what I tried to show in Healing Our World is that it's liberty that is the friend of the poor. It's liberty that saves the environment. It's liberty that gives us all those things that politicians promise but never deliver. Mm -hmm. Whatever the saying, uh, as the saying goes, whatever the uh, problem, liberty is the answer. That's right. Uh, well, that's good. And now this new edition that's coming out, uh, have you made changes in the book? Yes, the 2003 edition, which is the one that I'm now really getting very active in promoting, uh, is, is expanded. I think there's probably another 25% added to it in terms of uh, actual word content and the number of references doubled. It won the freemarket.net Book of the Year Award in 2003, and it really, it really tries to come from the heart. And a lot of people give this book to their liberal friends in order to bring them to liberty, and I've had a lot of repeat buyers because it's been very successful in that way. Yes, it, it uh, does approach it from uh, a standpoint that should be more uh, conducive to liberal thinking and uh, left-wing thinking uh, because you're talking about the issues that are important to them and not dismissing them, but rather hitting them head-on. Um, Tell us a little bit about uh, your background in the pharmaceutical industry. You sent me a document this past week. Um, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't tell you the uh, the title of it, but it's, go ahead. It's Deadly Secrets Behind Soaring Pharmaceutical Prices. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I found it fascinating. I mean, it's, it's no big uh, surprise that it's government regulation that causes uh, uh, prices to, to, to soar in the pharmaceutical industry, but yet I didn't realize exactly how that works, how just the many different ways that regulation affects prices. It isn't just lengthening the time it takes for approval and some of the obvious things that we hear a lot about. And I found the whole thing fascinating. Is there some way that people can get that document? Yes, well, actually, I'm doing a special promotion this Wednesday, October 12th. And even though Deadly Secrets normally retails for $30, your listeners can get it free if they buy a copy of Healing Our World at Amazon.com on October 12th. And what they need to do is to go to my website and get the instructions on exactly how to get it. It's part of a bonus bundle that's worth over $150. So your listeners will be able to buy Healing Our World for $24.95, and they'll be able to get, in addition, $150 worth of free bonuses, including Deadly Secrets. Uh, for, what did you say, $29.95? Uh, $24.95. $24.95. And um, is Amazon cooperating on this? Are they, are they uh, delivering these uh, bonuses? No, the bonuses are delivered, delivered through my website. So what people should do if they want to take advantage of this offer is go directly to my website, which is ruart.com, and right there on the home page you can see a link to the Amazon promotions. Mm -hmm. And that will help them go through the process. Um, and uh, you're hoping, of course, that uh, this will push this up the charts at Amazon, of course. That's right. Amazon keeps a record of their sales every day and lists a bestseller list of top 100. I'm hoping that if I can get Healing Our World high in the chart, that I'll be able to get um, a major publisher to pick up Healing and get it to the bookstores. That would be good. Now, we just have a couple of minutes left before we go to the uh, news break, but maybe you can just give us a taste of what's in Deadly Secrets, uh, and then we'll talk about it more after the news. Sure. Well, I talk about my career as a research scientist at the Epton Company and how regulation actually made it difficult for us to put out new innovative drugs. I also talk about how the legislation passed in 1962 added 10 years and created a situation where millions, millions of people have died waiting for life-saving drugs. Ten years to the regulation process to get a, a, a drug approved. Right. It used to be four and a half years before these regulations were passed, and now they're 14 and a half and climbing. And the danger, of course, there is that some people, like the AIDS patients, couldn't wait. 
So they went to underground chemists to make the drugs that companies like the Epton Company were working on. By the time we tried to do clinical studies, every patient in the country had already had our compound through the underground network. My gosh, I hadn't heard that before. Um, well, also, an awful lot of people died. And um, uh, you tell the story of, uh, isn't propolinol in there? I'm sorry? Isn't propolinol in there? Propanolol, yes, the heart disease. They have the first data blocker for heart disease. We got it three years later. Europe got it first. In fact, we used to go over to Europe to develop and market our, our compounds first because their regulations were much made it much easier, really, to get on the market. And um, there was a study done by uh, uh, Arthur D. Little Company? That's right. 10,000 people died every year in the U.S. because that drug wasn't available, at least. Gosh. Uh, and the FDA is supposed to save lives. <laughs> uh, we'll be back right after the news. You get to hear about the president's radio broadcast and other fiction. And we will uh, be talking further with Mary Ruart when we come back. So please don't go away. We've got another hour to go. And let's right now go to the phones and see what's on the mind of Matthew in Utah. Good evening, Matthew. Uh, good evening, Harry Brown. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that was my phone. Just, uh, I was just asking Mary a couple of questions about Drew Art. Um, first of all, I was wondering what uh, led her to join the libertarian movement, what sort of background uh, came about in that. And the other question I had was uh, if, actually, if she could uh, maybe give a little bit of an abbreviated story of what her experiences were that she was having by medication for her raised in price because of, of uh, government intervention, dealing with specific numbers and stuff like that. All right. Uh, Mary may have understood it completely, but I'm not sure I did. I think the second question was a specific example where the government uh, created a problem with giving us specific numbers of the, the changes that were wrought by the government intervention. The first one, uh, were you asking what her background was in the libertarian movement? Yeah, well, what, what made her decide to you know, change her philosophy to libertarian sort of philosophy? What, what sort of led her to that uh, conclusion? Oh. Sure. That's always interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I read Atlas Shrugged in college, and I was I was very intrigued by it because I realized that it was wrong to take money from other people as taxes. But it bothered me a lot because I thought that we needed to have taxes so that we could pay welfare to help the poor. And so what happened was I, I had um, I had been raised as a Catholic, although I wasn't uh, a practicing Catholic at that moment in time. And I really was very much into the concept of loving your neighbor. And then it dawned on me. Um, that if I went to my neighbor with a gun and took their money for taxes to help the poor, that I was actually acting less loving than they were. You know, they were being selfish perhaps, but I was actually doing violence, and that if I felt the poor needed to be helped, then, then I needed to step forward and set the example. So that was a real turning point for me. Um, and so I guess I come from a more liberal orientation, which is probably why healing our world is considered such a good primer for, for liberals. And your second question, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, it's easy to say things and not have documentation, and that's what the special report, Deadly Secrets, is all about. What I did is I went into the literature and I took a lot of studies that different people had, had performed, many of them peer-reviewed, in fact, most of them, which means that other people reviewed them before they were published, and they had to go through a lot of analysis before they were allowed to be published. And what I found was that the data is there to actually calculate how much money these regulations really cost the pharmaceutical industry in terms of research and development and how that cost is passed on to people. And what I found was that after the 1962 amendments, which was a, a very um, heavy-handed regulation on the pharmaceutical industry, the rate of increase that it cost to develop new pharmaceuticals went up 13-fold, 13 times, in other words, 1,300%. Wow. And, and it's very interesting because that is directly proportional to how much we pay for pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's just amazing to think what we could be paying for uh, prescription drugs in this country if it weren't for that. And we wouldn't have to have uh, politicians uh, saying, oh, I've got a prescription drug program that's going to ease the cost or uh, have the government pay part of it or anything else because the cost would be so low in the first place. That's right. It would be about 15%, one five, 15% of what it is now. That's, that's what I've calculated. And, and actually, it's a fairly conservative calculation because, you know, pharmaceuticals impact on our health care costs. In other words, when when... When I was a, a postdoctoral student, the way you took care of ulcer patients was you did surgery on them, and it cost $25,000, and they were out of work for several weeks. But when you have a new drug, Tegamet, when it came along, people could stay at work. Yes, it cost them 1000 or $2,000 for the drug, but they didn't have to have surgery, so it really reduced their overall health care costs. Um, and you can calculate what the impact of these regulations are because they drive up the cost of pharmaceuticals, and they extend the development time, and they keep new drugs off the market, you can actually calculate that our health care costs would be as much as uh, about 37% lower without these regulations. It may be that high. And I'll give an example uh, for your listeners of one compound that I worked on. My team and I were working on a prostaglandin for liver disease, and the FDA actually called me up personally and said, Dr. Ruart, we understand that you filed for a patent on prostaglandins and liver disease. And I said, yes, that's true. And they said, well, we really want you to develop this because 100,000 people die every year of liver disease. There's nothing for it. We'll help you in any way we can. 
And yet, even though I had the support of the FDA, the studies that they wanted us to do were just too difficult because we had to guess right on everything the first time. We had to guess right on the dose. Uh, we didn't know exactly, of course, what dose we needed. It was a chronic disease we had to treat for long periods of time. Uh, we didn't know how many patients we needed to get the statistical significance that they would accept. So we had to abandon the project. And, you know, people still are dying from liver disease, and maybe this would have helped. Why did you have to guess right the first time? They wouldn't let you do it a second time? We could do it a second time, but our patent would have run out. And uh, then it would have gone generic as soon as it hit the market. We'd never recover our costs. The yeah. average new drug today, in 2003, I should say, it costs, if you, if you just take the out-of-pocket costs for the pharmaceutical company, it's about $600 million. And if you capitalize it because it takes 14 and a half years to get it to market, then it's like $1.2 billion. And only three out of ten of these drugs recover their costs. So, you know, you're talking basically a roll of the dice for the pharmaceutical companies, which is why they've all had to merge. The little companies simply can't take that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things that I discovered in uh, your report, and I'd like to restate it for anybody who didn't quite get it. A patent uh, runs out at a certain time, and if the regulatory process is so long that by the time the regulation hurdles have been all met, uh, the patent has run out, then the drug company can't recover its cost because it now becomes generic, and uh, anybody can market the, the uh, drug and the exclusivity is no longer there for even one year. So uh, that's something I didn't realize before, but that means that if a company spends a half a billion dollars or a billion dollars on this, it's all gone. Mm -hmm. That's right, and you know it's interesting because something like a third of the drugs that go into late-phase testing, in other words, they've gone through 12 years or so of testing, they are abandoned at the very last minute because that, that little extra push at the end is simply too much. The pharmaceutical company has already figured out they're not going to recover their costs. They're not going to recover manufacturing, advertising, and R&D. It's just not going to happen, and they simply give up. Uh. Terrible. Um, you know, we wouldn't be so aghast and we wouldn't worry so much about this if this had something to do with, um, let's say, television sets or, or um, stereos or something of that sort. We're talking about people's lives here. Mary, can you give us a little background on the FDA, uh, when it started and when it actually began to have some teeth in it? Certainly. Um, there was a fledgling group uh, in the early, early 20th century, but it wasn't really until 1938 that new drugs had to be checked for safety, and the FDA basically accepted the data from the pharmaceutical firm, and if they didn't see anything wrong with it, then the pharmaceutical company could mark it uh, about six months after the FDA had received their application. And this worked pretty well. Um, the pharmaceutical industry flourished. Uh, at that point in time, the FDA process, the whole regulatory process, probably took about oh, somewhere between 7 and 15 percent of the total development time for a drug. Then, in 1962, Following the thalidomide disaster in Europe, which was a, a very safe sleeping pill that was given to women uh, when they were pregnant and, and, and caused some fetal deformities. And so people were very scared. It never really came to the U.S., but the U.S. used it as an excuse to adopt some regulations that had been sitting around in Congress for some time called the uh, Kefauver Harris Amendment. And what these 1962 amendments did is they really gave the FDA a lot of power, so much so that uh, the increase in the development time was about 10 years, whereas before that it had just been about, you know, in other words, it added 10 years. So it went from 4.5 years to 14 and a half years. And in addition to that, it really choked off the supply of new drugs. It just dropped. Uh, some people say it may have been as bad as, as taking out two out of every three new drugs. But in any case, it was, it was the 1962 amendments that gave the FDA all that power. Hmm. Uh, well, you know, in the late 1950s, I sold health insurance for a while. And uh, I used to sell policies that would cover a family for about $10 a month, sometimes $15 a month, covered uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, sometimes you had to wait six months with a pre-existing condition, depended. But it was also simple and easy and inexpensive. And, of course, in the 1960s later, then when Medicare and Medicaid were brought into existence, it uh, changed everything. And from then on, the cost of health insurance went way up, even though those particular programs were designed for the elderly and the poor. It affected everybody's cost of health insurance, and, um, and of course, with the increasing cost of drugs from 1962 on, uh, that added tremendously to the cost of health insurance also. Yes, yes. As we talked about earlier, the, the 62 amendments all by themselves may have added as the, they, may have, they may be responsible for about 37% of current health care costs. It could be that high. And the other thing, though, the real cost was not in money but in lives. According to the calculations in Deadly Secrets, as many as one out of three people who have died of disease since 1962 died needlessly because of these amendments, because life-saving drugs were, were kept from them at a time when they needed them wow. or, or didn't exist because, like the compound we talked about earlier that we were trying to develop for liver disease, they simply never made it to the market. When was that, incidentally? Oh, that was in the 80s. And, and it still isn't on the market? That's correct. Well, it's not on the market for liver disease, no, because in order, you see, it's very interesting how, how these regulations work. If you put a compound on the market for a particular disease, 
you know, say you put it on the market for ulcers and then found out later it was great against heart attacks, you have to go through the process again with that compound to some extent in order to make the claim that it works against heart disease. Otherwise, you cannot tell people about it. Mm-hmm. It's against the law. And so what ends up happening is some companies, of course, don't do anything about it. Others decide, well, you know, by the time we get through this process for the second indication, our compound will be off pad, and it's much smarter to start all over again. With so, something else. With something else. Instead of taking the cheaper route, they take this expensive route, and that's another reason why our health care costs are high and our pharmaceutical prices are high. You know, um, it, it, it all makes great sense and, um, in, in a way that I hadn't really added it up before. As I said at the beginning of the interview, I, I was well aware that regulation was driving up the cost of uh, prescription drugs but I didn't realize the mechanics of it, the, the specifics of how it worked in that way and actually kept drugs off the market. Mm-hmm. Um, it's amazing. Um, turning to another subject, uh, coming back to uh, your approach to this, and you said that you have a better open door to liberals, uh, which I can well understand. Do liberals, in your experience, respond to the concept of force, that uh, when you talk to them that what you're doing here is forcing people to do what they don't want to do, does that have any um, impact on them at all? It does if they're coming from a spiritual standpoint. You know, there's a whole movement um, of individual freedom and responsibility that's going on parallel to the political libertarian movement, and it's going on in more of a, how can I say, an emotional level or a spiritual level, I think maybe that's a little better, where a person takes responsibility for what they're thinking and feeling uh, as opposed to, you know, what's happening in the political world. And they're very parallel. So if you run into a liberal that has been misinformed about the effects of these laws and think that they're a good thing and that they support individual freedom and support individual choice, and they discover in discussions that's just the opposite, then they become libertarian immediately. I went to a conference once of such people, and I wasn't even a speaker. I was a student, and I just put my book out because they allowed us to put our products out if we wanted to. And I ended up having to call the publisher and getting another carton of books because 50% of the people at that meeting wanted a copy. Wow. And I didn't even say a word. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so those kind of people are very, very um, eager to embrace the libertarian philosophy. And, and so if, if that kind of liberal is very easy. Now, if it's a liberal that wants practical results, and all they care about is the result, then you won't move them with the idea of force. They think force is justified, the ends justify the means. But when you show them that liberty works better than force, then they're excited. And, of course, in the area of poverty, I really can speak quite a bit because I used to rent to low-income tenants, and I, I, I show them how lack of liberty is really creating poverty in this country. It, it, puts, it puts the low-income people out of work. Uh, you know, I had uh, tenants that were put out of work by regulation and told to go on welfare by the city officials. So you're able to, to show the pragmatic results. That's right. Um, when did you leave Upjohn? I left about 10 years ago. And what have you been doing since? Uh, since then, I've been doing consulting uh, with a number of nutraceutical and other firms, and I've also been, of course, writing and being active in, a, in the libertarian movement. All right, Mary, if this were a show for single men, I would ask you, and you were a man, I would ask you to give me your favorite pickup lines. But this is not that kind of show. It's a show for libertarians, and you are a libertarian salesman extraordinaire. So I want to ask you for some of your opening lines, how you approach people. Uh, uh, liberals especially, uh, are there some things that you find that are very, very useful as a way of starting a conversation? Well, I try to listen to what they say first and find out what they're really interested in because when you when you want to talk to someone about libertarianism, you want a subject, I think, that they're passionate about. And many liberals, of course, are passionate about the poor, so I might, might get into that. Many liberals are, um, they're actually, a lot of liberals actually are not, um, like I said, they're not as loving as one might think when one thinks of a liberal, but they're they're actually very angry um, at, at corporations, and they're angry at uh, what they perceive as a lot of injustice in the world. And usually they're somehow blaming private industry. So if that's what they're you know, going after, then I, I try to explain to them how government precipitates that, how, how they've actually created a lot of these problems. Uh, that's good. The, the secret, I've always felt that the secret of selling success is to find out what the prospect wants and show them how your product will deliver it. Yes, that's a great way of putting it. And you have to listen. As you said, you have to listen first and find out what they want, what they care about, what, what they're hoping to have happen, and then show them how liberty is the, the only way that that's ever going to be brought about. And then, of course, you have to have examples at hand of uh, ways in which the government has created some of these problems. And uh, so it helps to, to uh, do studying and find good examples. Examples are, are so much better in many cases than philosophy or principles or anything else. An example gets right to the heart of it. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, it, they are eye-openers. And then you can get to the principles. And then you can go from there to the philosophy. And the philosophy is that force never works. Force never produces the results that are promised for. Uh, it is not only wrong by almost every moral code in the world, but it is ineffective. And uh, I think that really is the key to the matter. And when we get that across the people, then we have generalized in a way that we don't have to go to every specific 
uh, uh, every specific issue that comes up and try to show in every specific case that force is not the answer. It is the answer. It is not the answer to anything. Mm-hmm. It's not the answer to world peace even. Well, especially world peace. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can't make peace by going to war. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, can you imagine? It just doesn't bring about world peace. <laughs> I know. You know, we have the blinders on. It's very interesting. It's like the emperor wears no clothes. We've really been, uh, as a society, we've truly been brainwashed. So it's, it's actually very exciting, I think, to be part of the libertarian movement and to have our eyes open and have the delight of helping other people to see. Yeah, it is a, it is a delight. And, uh, Mary, I certainly want to thank you for joining us this evening, taking uh, an hour and a half out of your time. And I hope we can do this again sometime. I hope we can, too, Harry. And I look forward to seeing you in at Atlanta. And I'd like to really thank you for having me on your show and thank all your listeners for tuning in. And thank you, Harry. Good night. Good night. It's Interesting that one time during the uh, conversation this evening, Mary mentioned the combination of love and liberty. And they really do go together because liberty is a loving concept. It is the, the wish and the desire to let people blossom on their own, to make their own decisions, to be able to live their own lives. And what we're giving to other people and giving them liberty and showing them the path of liberty is really uh, showing them in a certain sense love, compassion, and uh, uh, letting them be themselves. And I don't know of a greater gift you can give to anyone than liberty. And uh, uh, Mary made a very, very important point when she said that a good part of selling is listening, listening to what it is that people want instead of trying to impose what you want on them. Maybe they're not interested in gun rights. Maybe they don't care about the drug war one way or the other. So shut up and listen to them. Find out what they are interested in and then show them how liberty can get them more of what they want, whether it is Uh, better wages for the low-income people, whether it is better health care for people, whatever it may be, talk about what people want to hear and not what you think is the most important thing right now. The only way you'll get their ear, once you have their ear and once you have their interest and once you have them feeling that, well, there is something to this, then you can begin to talk about the principles involved and generalize on it and show them that this applies to just about anything you want to name. Force is never the answer. Liberty is always the answer. Whatever the question, liberty is the answer. This is Terry Brown. Good night.